بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everyone back Continuing our discussion of the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi Today we begin in chapter 9 What has come to us concerning the khuf The shoes, the leather shoes of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam So the first hadith, hadith number 71 We have been told By Hanad ibn al-Sari Waqiyah told us on the authority of Ad-Dalham ibn Salih On the authority of Hujayr ibn Abdullah ibn Buraida That his father said The Nagus, the emperor of Ethiopia, Najashi Gave the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam A pair of plain black shoes so he put them on, then performed the minor ritual ablution and wiped over them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what does this hadith tell us? It tells us a few things. Of course, it talks about the khuf. That's why it's in this chapter. But it gives us something else that's very important, which is that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, accepted gifts. And when he accepted gifts, he just took them as they came and assumed that they were pure, assumed that they were halal, assumed that they were okay. In the, in the explanation of this hadith, not all of the scholars agree that the Najashi at this time was Muslim. So even if one were to argue and say, well, the Najashi was, had converted and the Prophet ﷺ therefore was ex accepting a gift from uh, a fellow Muslim, that is not something that is absolutely determined. In other words, it's a difference of opinion. So this was the way, this is one of the ways of the sunnah. This is one of the ways of the Prophet Sassam, just to be easy about things. He got a gift, he used them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, and wiping over the khuf is an established sunnah. Wiping over the leather sock is an established sunnah. It has its conditions that we discuss in the books of fiqh. And it is something that is greatly, greatly transmitted uh, and it's something that is accepted by, you know, by all, by all schools. The next hadith 72, we have been told by Qutayda ibn Sa'id, Yahya ibn Zakariya ibn Abi Za'idah told us on the authority of Al-Hasan ibn Ayyash, on the authority of Abu Ishaq, on the authority of Al-Shab that Al-Mughira ibn Shu'aba said, radiallahu anhum, Dihya, a notable companion of the Prophet sallallahu gave him a pair of black shoes, so he wore them. And Israel said on the authority of Jabir, on the authority of Ahmed, he also gave him a gown, so he wore the shoes until they were perforated. Without the Prophet ﷺ knowing whether or not they were made from the hide of a lawfully slaughtered animal. Okay, Dehya was one of the famous companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He was actually one of the Prophet's ambassadors. And Dehya was a very handsome companion. He was so handsome that when Gabriel would come in the form of a man to the Prophet Sassam and to the companions, oftentimes he would take the form of Dihya al-Kalbi. He would, that when they would see Gabriel, you know, at first glance, like, oh, that's Dihya. And then when he comes closer, they're like, oh, that's not Dihya. He looks like Dihya, but he's not. And then they would realize that it was Gabriel. One of the uh, functions of the angels is that the angels can take human form like human form, not exactly like a human. So you would tell that it was not Dehya. Anyway, so Dehya was very handsome. And this was one of the reasons why the Prophet Sassana made him one of his ambassadors. And he spoke different languages. So when we come and talk about the government of the Prophet, Hukumatun Nabi Sallallahu you know, how he established his government and how he established connections with, with other states and things like that. These uh, little you know, facts give us an important insight into how the Prophet Sallallahu used to think and how he used to operate. Anyway, so Dihya radiallahu anhu, he gave the Prophet Sallallahu the khuf and this gown. And then the Prophet Sallallahu again, like in the previous hadith, he wore them. And then the narrator specifically states here that the Prophet Sallallahu did not have to pause and think, oh, is this halal or is this not halal? Why is this important? It's important because it teaches us an important rule in usul al-fiqh, in our principles of jurisprudence, 
that aslul ashya al ibaha that the original default ruling of things is that they are permissible until and unless something manifests to show us that they're not and that is uh, a um, a quality that unfortunately is withering away among some segments of our community some people they want everything to be haram until we have to prove that it's halal but that's not the sunnah the sunnah of the prophet is the exact opposite someone gives you something you know if like my neighbor one of my neighbors uh, gave me uh, cookies you know for the holidays what's the default H- how does the muslim think the default is that they're halal you don't go asking oh is this made with gelatin or is it fish gelatin or is it kosher gel or did you put any alcohol we don't we don't work like that we just take things simply however if my same neighbor who has actually happened before gave me a bottle of wine as a gift i know that that is haram because that is very you know overtly not permissible so i'm not saying that you know we have to use our minds but this hadith the way it's phrased and one of the, the one of the the strengths of this book and why it's so important is that we pick up the the spirit of the sunnah along the way so these two hadith that form this chapter they talk about the khuf they talk about the leather sock of the prophet sallallahu alaihi but look at the wording of how the hadith is transmitted to us it teaches us something about the demeanor of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he took things simply and i hope that in pray inshallah that this is something that we can inculcate in ourselves it reminds me there's a story uh, of Sayyidina Umar radiyallahu anhu when he was the Khalifa, I believe, and he was walking with his companions. And at the time of, of the companions, of the time of the Prophet, وسلم, there were not tall, tall buildings. You know, maybe uh, the tallest would be like a two or three story building. So they were walking in Medina and somebody... Uh, 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 met lady members of a particular house, maybe on the second or the third floor, they were cleaning and they had, you know, kind of thrown out a bucket of water from the balcony. And some of that water came down and, and it splashed on Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu and the person that he was walking with. So the man that was walking with Sayyidina Umar, he looked up and he said, you know, I, I ask you by Allah, is this water pure or not pure? <laughs> and you know, Omar, Sayyidina Omar radiallahu it's almost as if he put his hand on the man's mouth and he looked up and he said, I, I ask you by Allah not to answer this man. You know, don't answer this man because this is not how our deen is. We, we, don't, we don't function like it. It's water. Why do you have to go and investigate, you know, is it tahir, is it not tahir? Because that's how you make the permissible unpermissible. That's how you can make halal things haram. And that's one of the the wisdoms of the story of uh, the Baqarah in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is actually what I originally wanted to talk about today in Jummah, but I had, you know, Allah had other plans. Anyway, the next chapter, chapter 10. What has come to us concerning the sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the sandals, the blessed sandals, the na'al of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I think I have a picture of it here or... Okay, I don't, I was not prepared, so I apologize. However, Imam Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu anhu, one of the great tabi'een, when he would describe the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his companions, you know, he would describe his physical features in similar fashion as the way that this book is constructed. And then when he would come to the sandals of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said he wore sandals, na'al, in Arabic. We are elevated by the remembrance of these sandals. It's a very famous statement of Imam Hassan al Basri. Why are we elevated by remembering the sandals of the Prophet? The reason why Imam Hassan al Basri said that, and the reason why you know, the sandal of the Prophet is such a ubiquitous diagram in amongst us. Uh, people decorate their homes with it. They decorate their clothes with it. They put it on rings and they wear them on their on their hands. And why? Because for a normal person, you know, the most insignificant thing would be their sandals. But for us, 
and for, because it is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most what would for a normal person be the most insignificant thing for us, it is the greatest thing. So even though you know who cares about somebody's flip flops, but these are the the sandals of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we are elevated by remembering them because they are the greatest aspect of him. Why are they the greatest aspect? You know, Imam Hassan al-Basri, he is, he is reminding us of something very, very deep. So when his companion said, why are we elevated by the remembrance of the sandals? And he said, because when Moses alayhi salam was in discourse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala told him, Allah ta'ala says to Moses in the Quran, take off your sandals because you are in a holy place. But in the Ma'raj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ascended the heavens and he was not asked to remove his sandals. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, this is the, this is deep stuff, guys. This is, this is really, really deep. This is the, the type of devotion and love that the, the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Ulama had for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, we are elevated, and inshallah, may we be elevated by reciting these hadith. So, the first hadith in this chapter, hadith 73, we have been told by Muhammad ibn Bashar Abu Dawood told us, Hammam told us that Qatada said, I asked Anas ibn Malik, how were the sandals of Allah's Messenger? He said they had two thongs. So, the sandal of the Prophet, he, he would put between his toe and the immediate. Uh, his big toe and his second toe, he would put one thong and between the middle toe and then the toe to its right, he would put another thong. So that way his feet were firmly established uh, on it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, the ulama, they say that sandals is a prophetic sunnah. All of the prophets wore sandals. And this is a sign of humil the humility of the sandals. Of, of course, today, uh, we don't we don't wear sandals all the time. You know, we wear shoes, and then people compete with shoes, and you know what kind of leather is the shoe made out of, and who's the designer, and you know we show off with our shoes. But the fact that the greatest of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just simply wore sandals, this is a sign of his humility. And 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 for the Salafi leaning people amongst us, we have to also remember that it was compatible with the with the desert climate. So you know, don't go to Michigan and Minnesota in the winter and say to Sunnah to wear sandals, you know, you're going to end up getting frostbite. So you have to also understand that this was what was normal at the time. Hadith 74, we have been told by Abu Quraib, Muhammad ibn al-A'la, Waqiyah told us on the authority of Sufyan, on the authority of Khalid, uh, I have to look at the Arabic, Khalid uh, al-Hadha, on the authority of Abdullah ibn al-Harith, that ibn Abbas said, the sandals of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa had two thongs with folded laces. Hadith 75, we have been told by Ahmed ibn Mania and Yaqub ibn Ibrahim, Abu Ahmed as Zubair told us that Isa ibn Ahman said, Anas ibn Malik brought out to us a, a pair of hairless sandals with two thong. Hairless meaning there was no leather, or it was very simple. Then Thabit told me afterwards on the authority of Anas that they were the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does this mean? This means that the companions kept the artifacts of the Prophet Sallallahu in their possession for the barakah of them. Here, this is Anas ibn Malik, you know, the, one of the greatest companions, kept with him the sandal of the Prophet, so the actual sandal, and showed the other companions that didn't see it or the tabi'in. And this is what the Prophet's sandals looked like, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is, a, as I mentioned before, in previous uh, discussions of the Shema'in, this is something that is an established sunnah, that the Sahaba used to seek blessings from the artifacts of the Prophet Sallallahu whether it be his hair, or whether it be his sweat, or whether it be his, his artifacts, his, his stick, his sword, his, his, uh, his bow, uh, his bowl, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is something that is established, uh, absolutely established, without any doubt or without any even need of, of, of fancy tafsir. I think this chapter is it's not that long. Okay. Hadith 76. We have been told by Ishaq ibn Musa al-Ansari. Ma'an told us, Malik told us, Sa'id ibn Abi Sa'id al-Maqbari told us that Ubaid ibn Juraj said to ibn Umar, I saw you wearing the tanned ox hide sandals with no hair on them. 
He replied, I saw Allah's Messenger وسلم, wearing the sandals on which there is no hair, and he performed the minor ritual ablution in them, so I love to wear them. Hadith 77, we've been told by Ishaq ibn Mansur, Abdul Razak told us on the authority of Mamar, on the authority of Ibn Abi, on the authority of Salah, the Mawla of a Mawla of at Tu'mah, that Abu Huraira said the sandals of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two thongs. Okay, so he, he, it's not like our modern flip-flops, it's just one thong between our big toe and, and the second toe. The Prophet sallallahu had two. Hadith 78, we have been told by Ahmed ibn Mania, Abu Ahmed told us, Sufyan told us, that a Suddi told, Suddi said, someone told me that he heard Amr ibn Hurayth say, I saw Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performing the ritual prayer in sewn sandals. And of course, this is a, a fiqh issue. Can you pray with your sandals? Uh, you can pray with them if they are you know, placed on tahara uh, and there's no filth on them, but you can't walk into the mosque. That's just if, if you're praying outside. So some people they'll take this and they'll actually walk in the mosque with their shoes and say, this is the sunnah. That's not the sunnah. Hadith 79, we have been told by Ishaq ibn Musa al-Ansari, man told us, Malik told us on the authority of Abu Zinad, on the authority of Al-Araj, on the authority of Abu Huraira. Allah's Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let none of you walk in a single sandal, let him shoe, shoe, shoe them both or take them both off. And this is a, um, a common issue when we discuss clothing in Islam. This prohibition is a prohibition that establishes that something is disliked, makruh, not that it is haram. And you will find that the sunnah is to be balanced. So the sunnah is to wear them both or take them both off, not walk around with one. The, the sunnah is that your clothes are, are balanced, not that like one side is longer than the other, for example. So this is a, the, the balance of, of one's uh, hay'a, of how they look and how they dress, is something that is going to be uh, common uh, into, in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, I'll skip 80, 81. We have been told by Ishaq ibn Musa, man told us, Malik told us on the authority of Abu Zubair, on the authority of Jabir radiallahu anhum ajma'in, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade one, referring to the man to eat with his left hand or to walk in a single sandal. Again, the same concept. For, this is uh, a prohibition for something being disliked, makruh, not being haram. This is an issue that we discuss in Usul al-Fiqh, how do you know the difference? However, it should be said that when it comes to eating, there is a difference of opinion. That some of the ulama would say that eating with the left hand is haram because there are other hadith that talk about that. We are going to talk about eating in a couple of uh, weeks, in a couple of chapters. However, it's important to remember that the idea of eating with your right hand and not with your left hand is when you are eating using one hand alone. So for example, I have a glass of water next to me. So if I wanna grab it, I, have, I would grab it with my right hand and drink. But if I was, let's say one of you sent me a text message now or, or something and I'm, and I'm holding my phone with my right hand looking at it and I wanted to, to drink water, I could grab it with my left hand and drink because both of my hands are engaged. So the etiquette of eating with the right is oftentimes misunderstood by Muslims to think that you can only eat or drink with your right. That's not how we, would, we should phrase it. Rather, we should say that it is the sunnah if it is used singularly. But if both hands are engaged in eating, you can use the right and the left. What does that mean for us today? If you went to a Western uh, dinner table, you know, the fork is on the left and the knife is on the right. Many Muslims, they think that they have to reverse it. But if you are, you know, stabbing your food with the fork on the left and then cutting it with the right, both of the hands are engaged in the act of eating. So then you can put the morsel of food in your mouth with your left. And this is the hadith that is in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ate with both hands when both were engaged. We'll get to that later. But because it's mentioned in this hadith, I thought I would flag it. Okay, hadith number 82. We have been told by Qutayba on the authority of Malik and Ishaq ibn Musa told us, also told us, man told us, Malik told us on the authority of Abu Zinad, on the authority of Al-Araj that Abu Huraira said, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
when one of you puts on sandals, let him begin with the right. And when he takes them off, let him begin with the left. For the right must be the first of them to be put on and the last of them to be taken off. Again, this is another sunnah. This is not about haram and halal. This is about the complete, you know, adherence to the sunnah, like perfection. So, and, and likewise, based on this hadith, for all articles of clothing. So the sunnah is that when you put on an article of clothing, you begin with the right. So if like I put on this like my thobe, I would begin with the right and then put it in my left. But then when I take it off, I would begin by taking off my left and then taking off my right. So how do you do this when you enter the mosque? Okay, so you walk into the mosque. You would step into the mosque with your right foot. And then you would take off your left shoe and then your right shoe. And then when you finish praying and then you exit the mosque, you have your shoes with you. You place the shoes outside of the mosque. You step out of the mosque with your left foot and you put your left foot on top of your shoe. And then you step out with your right foot. You put the shoe on your right foot and then your shoe on your left foot. Why is this important? Well, it's important because this is the sunnah. This is how the Prophet ﷺ lived his life. This is how he would do it. And out of our love and respect for him, this is something that we know. What I just described to you is exactly how the Sahaba described how the Prophet ﷺ implemented this hadith. This doesn't mean that this is the you know this is going to make it or break it in Islam. That if you don't do this, then you're not a Muslim. It doesn't mean that. And then I never said that. But it is important that these things instill in us a, a type of discipline. Why is this part of the Sunnah? It's part of the Sunnah because it's, it takes discipline to do this. So every time you walk in the mosque or you walk out the mosque or you walk in your house or you walk out of your house or you put on an article of clothing and you remember this, you are trying to instill the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu in your life. It doesn't mean that this is the only sunnah or that this is the most important sunnah. It's not about that, but it's about the sunnah is an entire package. So this is one of those things that we have the guidance of from the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. Hadith 83, we have been told by Abu Musa Muhammad Ibn Al-Muthanna, Muhammad Ibn Jafar told us, Shawabah told us, Ash'ab, that is, Ibn Abi, Abi Ash-Sha'atha told us on the authority of his father, on the authority of Masruq, that Aisha alayhi salam said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam would love to start whatever he could on the right side in his combing, his footwear, and his purification. So this is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then the last hadith of this chapter, hadith 84, we have been told by Muhammad Ibn Masruq, Abu Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, Ibn Qais, Abu Muawiyah told us, Hisham told us on the authority of Muhammad Ibn Sirin that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, the sandals of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had two thongs as did those of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma and the first to tie a single knot was Uthman radiallahu anhu. Why is this hadith important? This hadith is important, it's actually very important because it establishes for us a rule which is by Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu altering his footwear, he is establishing for us that clothing is a sunnah, not a fard. In other words, it is permissible not to wear the sandal exactly the way that the Prophet Sallallahu wore it. Otherwise, Sayyidina Uthman wouldn't have done it. But by doing it, he's showing us the permissibility of doing that the permissibility of altering articles of clothing. So we are talking about the sunnah. The, the, this is how the Prophet Wasallam used to dress. This doesn't mean that we have to dress like that, but it's important that we know how he dressed because there is nothing, absolutely nothing that we don't know about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is one of the miracles of his prophecy. And this is one of the miracles of this faith that we, that we have these type of documents. We know everything about him. And there are even descriptions of how he smelled, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, find me a historical figure. Like, do you know what Shakespeare smelled like? Or what he even looked like? And, you know, scholars still debate, was it one Shakespeare? Was it multiple Shakespeare? Was it a man? Was it a woman? How did Shakespeare actually sound? The English of the time of Shakespeare. We're not entirely sure exactly how it sounded. But we know how the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sounded. He described for us how revelation sounded. The Sahaba talked about how he smelled 
how soft his hands were, etc. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. And then the last chapter for today, chapter 11, what has come to us concerning the quality of the signet ring, khatam of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallam, used to wear a ring and this chapter and the next chapter, which we'll take next time, are dedicated to this. We have been told by Qutayba ibn Sa'id on the authority of Abdullah ibn Wahab, on the authority of Yunus, on the authority of ibn Shihab that Anas ibn Malik said, the signet ring of the Prophet وسلم, consisted of silver and its stone was Abyssinian. Of course, in the history of the ring of the Prophet وسلم, he first wore a gold ring before the prohibition. And then like when he was praying, the gold was, was interfering with his concentration and he took it off. And then the Prophet and then the prohibition came for gold for men. And then the Prophet وسلم's ring was silver. Again, what's the, what's the point that it was its stone was Abyssinian. Right? This again shows us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wore different articles of clothing and used different tools and things from other places. Hadith 86, we have been told by Qutayba Abu Awana told us on the authority of Abu Bishr, on the authority of Nafa, that Ibn Umar said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose a signet ring of silver. So he used to seal with it and he would not wear it. Hadith 87, we have been told by Mahmoud ibn Ghaylan, Hafs ibn Umar ibn Ubaid, said Zuhair, told us on the authority of Humayd that Anas ibn Malik said the signet ring of the Prophet Sassam consisted of silver, including its stone. So in this narration, the whole thing was, was silver. And the other narration, it's silver, and then the stone was Abyssinian, or the stone was Aqiq, etc. Hadith 88, we have been told by Ishaq ibn Mansur, Mu'ayd ibn Hisham told us, my father told me on the authority of Qatada that Anas ibn Malik said, when Allah's Messenger وسلم, wished to write to the non-Arabs, meaning the, the leaders of the non-Arab nations, he was told the non-Arabs will not accept a letter unless it bears a seal. He therefore created a signet, and, it see, uh, and I seem to notice its witness in the palm of his hand. So this is the, this is the key hadith in this chapter, that the Prophet وسلم, the reason he wore a ring, or he had a ring, was that he was told Look, if you want to be a statesman and you're going to write to the Roman emperor and you're going to write to the Najesh and uh, the Negus of Abyssinia, which was an empire, uh, the, em the em empire of Axiom, if you're going to write, write to the Muqawqas, if you're going to write to Qaisar, uh, to uh, uh, Khosrow, Kisra, etc., you know, the letter that you have has to be stamped. Why? Because that's what was normal at that time. Again, this is a very important thing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted that. He said, oh, okay, yeah, then that's what's standard. So we need to do what's considered normal because we are at that level now. So when you talk about the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you talk about his hukuma, his government, you will find that this, this was normal. He was told that this is what was considered standard, so he did it. He didn't say, I, I don't have to, or this is bid'ah, this is not in the Quran and the Sunnah. He said, oh, if, that, if that's what's considered normal, then we will do it. And the Prophet Sassam accepted things like that. The Prophet's ring, alayhi salatu salam, it said from bottom to top, Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. And in the hadith, I seem to notice its, its whiteness, sorry, its whiteness in the palm of his hand. That some of the hadith say that, that, that he would wear the ring like this. So it was in the palm of his hand. And he would stamp like this rather than wearing his ring like this. Um, and then uh, there are actually, till today, in existence, the actual letters that the Prophet وسلم, wrote. And you will see in the bottom corner his stamp from his ring. And Allah Ta'ala has blessed me that I have seen one of these letters. It is the letter... Uh, to the Roman Emperor, and it is housed in a museum in Amman, Jordan. May Allah Ta'ala protect the Kingdom of Jordan. Hadith 89, we have been told by Muhammad ibn Yahya, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Ansari told us, my father told me on the authority of Thamama that Anas ibn Malik said, the inscription engraved in Arabic script on the signet ring of Allah's Messenger وسلم, was Muhammad forming one line, Rasul forming one line, and Allah forming another line. Why is it from bottom to top? is that the Prophet Sassam did not want his name to be on top of Allah's name. So from bottom to top, it says Muhammad Rasul Allah. 
صلى الله عليه وسلم. Hadith 90. We have been told by Nasr ibn Ali al. I gotta read it in Arabic. Al Jahdami. Nuh ibn Qais told us on the authority of Khalid ibn Qais, on the authority of Qutada, that Anas ibn Malik said the Prophet وسلم, wrote to Khusro, Caesar, and the Nagas, so he was told the non Arabs will not accept a letter unless it bears a seal. Allah's Messenger وسلم, therefore created a signet which had a silver ring and on which was engraved Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have been, I mean, isn't that amazing that you can actually see this? You can Google right now, you know, Prophet's letter to. Uh, you know, Kaiser or whatever, you'll see the actual letter. It's, I mean, we're not making this up, right? This is unbelievable that these artifacts actually exist. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have a special story with that letter. Maybe one time, I'll, I'll, no, I won't share it now. One time we should share it. We have been told by uh, Ishaq ibn Mansur, Saeed ibn Amir, and Al-Hajjaj ibn Minhal told us on the authority of Hammam, on the authority of Ibn Juraj, on the authority of Az-Zuhri, that Anas said when Allah's Messenger وسلم, entered the toilet, he used to remove his signet ring. Why? Because it had it on the name Allah. Okay, so this is another sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the last hadith for tonight, we have been told by Ishaq ibn Mansur, Abdullah ibn Numair told us, Ubaidullah ibn Umar told us on the authority of a nafa that Ibn Umar said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose a signet ring of silver, so it was in his possession. Then it was in the possession of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and then the possession of Sayyidina Umar. Then it was in the possession of Sayyidina Uthman until it fell into the well of, uh, the well of Aris. Its engraved inscription was Muhammad is a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the story is that Sayyidina Uthman he would wear the ring and he would, you know, like, like I do sometimes, he would like kind of like take it off and he was like thinking. And then one time he was doing that and it fell and it fell in this well. And, and he ordered that, you know, the well be dug up and they spent two, three days trying to find the ring and they couldn't find it. Imam Suyuti radiallahu anhu commenting on this story, he says in the ring of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a, is a, a deeper meaning because it was after the caliphate of Sayyidina Uthman that a lot of the fitna began. And the reason that Sayyidina Uthman was so concerned to try to find the ring is that he knew that if the ring was lost, this was a sign that you know, other things would, would come. Uh, and that's why the hadith is mentioned because of that deep meaning. It's not just that the ring was lost. I mean, you know, artifacts are lost. It's okay. We, we have the sunnah of the Prophet Sassam with us. We don't need the actual ring. But the fact that it was lost was a sign that you know something was was going to happen. So the idea is that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Uthman, they would use the ring of the Prophet Sassam to stamp their letters in addition with one of their own stamps because of the barakah that's in the ring of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, another indication and another sign of the importance and the permissibility of seeking the blessings and the barakah of the artifacts of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wallahu Ta'ala A'la Wa A'lam Okay, let me see your questions Can one simply wipe water over one's feet and socks rather than take out the socks and wash? Some men often put their feet in the wash basin and wash their feet we should gently dissuade people from doing this. So, uh, so the issue is that when you put your sock on your feet, if you have full wudu, that sock becomes a part of your body. And if the sock covers from your toes all the way to above your ankles, and uh, has no holes in it, you are allowed to wipe over it when you lose your wudu and then make another wudu after that, as long as you've put the socks on your feet. This is the position uh, uh, of the Hanbali school, and it is the, usually the position that we give when people ask, you know, from a fatwa point of view, even though the position has some weakness, 
because the, the sock of the sunnah is a sock that's waterproof, but the, the hanbalis allow uh, anything that would cover the feet. So if you put your sock on after you have full wudu, then when you break your wudu in that state, you are allowed to wipe over your sock for a period of 24 hours. If you're traveling, you're allowed to wipe over it for a period of three days. So yes, you don't have to take your socks off, uh, you know, and, and, and splash the bathroom and, and all of that. So you have to follow that condition. <clears throat> what types of rings are recommended that men should wear? Any, any ring would fulfill the sunnah. So if a man wore the ring, uh, of course, it, it can't be made out of gold, but it can be made out of you know, bronze or steel or, or platinum or silver or whatever, but not gold. Uh, then it would be it would fulfill the sunnah. It doesn't have to have a stone on it, or you know, so a, any ring would fulfill the sunnah. Do you have to wear the ring? Can you not be without ring? No, wearing the ring is only a sunnah. It's not a fard. You don't have to wear a ring at all. Exactly. Some men don't like to wear rings. Some in, in some cultures they they you know they think that a man shouldn't wear any jewelry. Even there's an expression in English: "Never trust a man with jewelry." Uh, I mean, I don't know I don't know the origin of that, but I mean, I, you hear that. So it's it's just a sunnah. And the Prophet Sallallahu it wasn't like a permanent fixture on his hand. You know, he wore it for the purpose of stamping the documents. That's another thing. Uh, I, I, if I'm traveling, how many days can I pray Qasr prayers? You can shorten your prayers when you're traveling. If your travel is three days plus the day of travel to and the day of travel back, that's the maximum amount of shortening the prayers. So let's say uh, today we travel to New York City. So today's Friday. So this is the day of travel too. We're gonna to stay in New York Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and come back Tuesday. That's the maximum amount allowable to shorten the prayers. Let's say we are gonna to go to New York for the week. The day, today is Friday, we're traveling to New York. As we are traveling to New York, we're travelers. We're allowed to shorten our prayers. But the minute we enter into the city limits of New York City, because we are intending to stay for the week, we are no longer travelers. So we no longer are allowed to shorten our prayers. Which finger should wear the ring and which hand? That's in the next chapter. Chapter 12, what has come to us concerning the fact that the Prophet Sallam used to wear the signet ring on his right hand. And then the chapter, and then there's hadith about the right and the left. So we'll save that for next week, inshallah. But the sunnah is either the right or the left with the majority of the hadith indicating that it was on his right hand, sallallahu alayhi wa Well, everyone's quiet today. Interesting. Or maybe that's because Tuesday we have the Ask uh, Tariq uh, day, so everyone's saving their questions for Tuesday. Oh, I forgot something very important to say. The most important thing I'm gonna say tonight is that now that we are in the new year, inshallah, I wanna remind everybody of the absolute fundamental importance of supporting ICCP financially. So just because we're all online and you know, we're in this pandemic situation, I don't want people to think that the, the machine of the mosque is not working. Uh, so I know that you know, people are you know, it is what it is. You know, the situation is, is what it is, inshallah, will get better. But, you know, don't forget that Ramadan is around the corner, believe it or not. Uh, we have, I think, maybe slightly over 100 days. So I'm going to keep reminding everybody uh, that of our communal obligation, inshallah, to support the center. So please do, uh, you know, because we don't have Juma in the mosque and, and all of these classes are happening online, we are not getting, you know, the weekly type of support. 
uh, that we are, are used to. So I, 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 in all seriousness, please do not forget uh, the mosque, inshallah. I know you wear your ring in your right hand, third finger. I think we, we talk about before now what I'm seeing, lots of LGB wearing in the right hand, third finger. So I start wearing in the right hand, any thought. The sunnah is the sunnah. So you, just because somebody else does something that's similar to the sunnah, it doesn't mean that I'm going to leave the sunnah. I wear the ring because it's a sunnah and I wear it on my ring finger on my right hand. Okay, so if somebody else that does things and believes in things that I don't believe in does the same thing, I'm not following their sunnah. I'm following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't give any thought to that. Can we eat something that is bacon flavor? Uh, I would, well, it depends how the flavor, if it comes from actual pork product, then it's going to be haram. If it's artificially or, or, you know, made in a lab to smell like something, then it would be okay. So, I mean, I'd have to look into that to know, but I, I wouldn't want to, <laughs> I wouldn't feel comfortable just because the smell I wouldn't feel comfortable with. Is it allowed for people who are naturally born left-handed to use their left hand to eat? Uh, yes, you're following the opinion that it's just makru. Oh, sorry, bacon flavored but contains no pork. Again, what's the origin of the flavor? If the origin of the flavor is actually comes from a pig product, it's going to be najis and therefore haram. But if it's artificially made to smell like that, then it would be permissible. Can you repeat in your in short your khutbah today of the importance of mind your language? Uh, the khutbah or the message was, you know, we have to, words are very important. For us as Muslims, it will always be important. Every word has some kind of weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the stuff that we're saying right now, it's being written down. Somebody's, I'm doing most of the talking, right? It's all of this is going to be written down for me. I have to be mindful of that. I'm going to face Allah Ta'ala with this. He's going to say on, you know, January 8th, uh, Friday, January 8th at 7.30 p.m., you said this, 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 and this. I'm going to be, it's either going to be for me or against me. We have to remember that fact. The, those of you who are typing, that's, that's going to be for you or against you. I mean, inshallah, all of this is in our Hasanat, Mizan of, of Hasanat, this is a gathering of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet Sassam told us in these gatherings, Allah ta'ala descends upon us with his mercy and with his angels, and we are forgiven, inshallah. So we know that this is a, you know, this is language that is good. But I don't want people to think that when they're online and they're tweeting and, and typing and all of that, that that language doesn't count. It counts as well. And the mess that this country has gotten into, a lot of it has to do with language. People, the rhetoric, they call it the rhetoric, you know, but people are talking. And we have a very rich tradition going back to the Prophet Sallallahu praising silence and silence being a sign of wisdom. And the reason we praise silence is because the silent person is in control of their language and therefore can judge and can determine, is it good for me to speak now or not good for me to speak now? And not all the time, blah, blah, you know, it's just going on and on and on and on. And this has a deep spiritual meaning because the ulama said that silence and lessening speech is a way to, to reach a greater awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're always talking, you're not taking anything in. So it's output, but there's no input. But when you're silent, you're, you, know, you, can, you can contemplate or you should contemplate. That's sort of what we were talking about. How would you recommend introducing the beauty of the Prophet's character to non-Muslim friends who actually seek the truth? You be the sunnah. You be that character for them. Because they are going to see you. You're going to be your exam the, the example. Uh, this, this conversation that we're having, this is you know, internal, right? This is for people that are in the tribe already. But somebody that's not in the tribe, they're going to know you. They're going to know you. And we want to be mirrors of that truth. So be the best version of yourself. You know, do things that nobody's going to, nobody opens the door for people anymore. Have you noticed that? Nobody opens the door for anyone anymore. I was uh, in the airport recently and there was a, a family 
and we were boarding. And uh, I think it was a mom, a, a father, and these two, two young girls. And they were looking for chairs and I was sitting on a chair. So I got up, you know, and they were like, they were like shocked that I got up. I got up, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, boasting. I got up because that's what you're supposed to, I don't need to sit on the chair. She should, so a mother with two kids. People don't do that stuff anymore. They need, people need to see in us that, that we will go out of our way to show kindness and mercy. There's no mercy anymore in society. If somebody cuts you off, you know, they want to like kill you on the road. They call it road rage. So our job is to be that sunnah, to be how the Prophet Sassam was, because that's how, and that's how they will know. And when they ask, uh, when they ask you, you know, why do you do this? That's when you can say, because this is what we were taught. This is what the Prophet Sassam taught us how to act. And you will be, you will be surprised. People will ask you all the time when you believe in something or when something bad happens and you're patient or when you do something that they think is you know, abnormal, like no one, no one would do something like that for me. That's when you say, you know, this is what the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Non-Muslims don't read the Quran, don't read the Hadith, they read you. Khabib. Yeah, that's right. That's what Khabib said, right? Exactly. The Sunnah of Khabib. How should we consider the welfare of animals when it comes to meat slaughter? Even if the obligatory components of the actual slaughter were carried out, but the animal may not have been treated kindly prior to that, is the meat still halal? Yeah, there's a difference between halal and tayyib. Those are two different conditions. The threshold of the law is that it's halal, that it's slaughtered. The, the, the threshold of kamal, you know, to, to fully follow the sunnah is that you treat the animal uh, with, you know, with, with uh, care. So uh, there's a difference between the two. Inshallah, we hope that we go the, for the full, full marks, you know, halal and tayyib. But that's not the legal uh, threshold or the legal limit. Why? Because the, the Sharia has mercy for those, you know, for everybody. If that was a threshold, then, you know, it would be very hard to meet. So that's something we should strive for. So, so I do realize that Tuesday we are meeting again. So if people have other questions, you know, please feel free to, to share them and uh, we can answer, you know, Tuesday will be a session just for this. What is the COVID situation in Egypt? Alhamdulillah, there's no COVID in Egypt. I realized when I went there. So apparently there's no COVID and there's no need to take any precautions. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, it's, it's very bad. And, uh, you know, a lot of mercy on, on, our country, on our countries. You have to, this whole social distancing and mask wearing, it has to be self-imposed. You know, you have to be very vigilant yourself. If you rely on your, your fellow countrymen, uh, you're not going to get, you, you will get COVID. So. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's pretty shocking. Is it true that the Prophet was mostly vegetarian? Now, I wouldn't use language like that, uh, but I would say that the Prophet did not eat meat every day. Uh, these are new concepts, new, new terms. We're going to talk about how he ate. So Sister Deba, I always bring up the last sermon, especially about race issues. Well, Shanaz and, and Diva, you guys can talk to I don't. You don't need to talk through me if you guys want to talk together about, you know. <clears throat> we, we do have a session on Tuesday. I, I am right in saying that, correct? Yeah, okay. I, 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 I anticipate that email that I get, you know, Monday night or Tuesday morning with all the questions. <clears throat> Is it haram to not get married? Uh, it's not haram, but it's tough. That's a tough road. Uh, you can get married and also not have children. Uh, that's another thing. So I think marriage is important. I, I would not live the single life. I would try to get married because I think companionship is important. Oftentimes people co conflate marriage and, and childbearing. You know, the two are separate issues. But is it haram? Not here, you know, it's not haram, but it is a, it is a very strong sunnah. Um, there are examples of people in the past, all I met and saintly people who were not married, you know, but they lived, like Imam al he lived a very tough life. Like he died very young and, you know, he slept for like 
three years just leaning against you know bookcase and never lied down. I mean, it was very hard to be like that. That that has to come from within. So, uh, you know, as somebody who has been married for you know nearly now twenty years, uh, I can't imagine you know being single all this time. I think it's 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 a, it's a great protection, and and having companionship and, and and whatnot. So I would strongly recommend that people get married. But no, it's not on the books. It's not haram. But it is strongly recommended both in Sunnah as well as multiple places in the Quran. Yes, it's not just that, but the Prophet addressed this question directly when he was, there were three companions that came to visit him and the Prophet was not in the room yet and he overheard them talking. The first companion, he said, I'm, I'm going to fast every day of the year. The second companion said, I'm going to stay up all night, every night and pray. And then the third companion said, I'm never going to get married. And then the Prophet ﷺ walked into the room and he said, as for me, I will fast some days and break my fast some days. I will spend some of the night in prayer and I will marry. So whoever violates and leaves my sunnah is not from me. So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to be married and to have children and to be a family man. That's the sunnah. I mean, for both men and, and for women, of course. Um, but the, the fiqh issue, the question, is it haram not to get married? It's not haram, as long as, as you know, there's a reason behind it. How long can you delay marriage? Should it be done as soon as possible? No, that's subjective because you have to be ready for marriage. Some people get married young. Some people, they, they take time to get married. Some people, if they get married young, it will be disastrous. So you have to be married and you, ha uh, you have to be ready for it and you, and you have to have the preconditions. Man minkum The Prophet says, whoever has al-ba' al-ba' is you are ready for it. Financially, you are ready for it. Psychologically, you're mature enough you know, to, to have that. If you have those conditions, that's when you're ready to be married. What relationship can a man have with a child he had out of wedlock? He can marry the mother. And marry the mother and then divorce and, and, and you know maintain the upkeep of the child okay so Tuesday inshallah we have a uh, ask me session so uh, I'll get all those questions uh, for Tuesday. I don't want to go too much now with all the questions and then Tuesday, you know, they're crickets. So unless there's anything pressing, what is the proper way to purify after intimacy is to take a ghusl, is to do the purification bath. The ghusl is that you wet every part of your body, which is basically what we say is a shower, starting with your hair, and the roots of your hair all, and all parts of your body from head to toe with the intention. That's the ghusl. So after, uh, after intercourse for both men and for women, we, we have to take the purification, the ghusl, to be able to resume our uh, ritual functions. And after the woman's monthly cycle, the same thing. So it's basically take a shower with the intention for purification. To put the water in the mouth and also in the nose, in some mazahib, is also part of the. That's the that's the sunnah because the inside the mouth and inside the nose is inside the body. The ghusl is that we 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 wash the outside of the body, so the outside of the nose, the outside of the mouth. I thought the, that in Hanafi madhab, it is the part of the uh, ghusl. Okay, I don't know if that's the case, then uh, I'll stand corrected. So there's a difference of opinion there. Okay. So I'll see everyone Tuesday, inshallah. Wallahu ta'ala a'ala wa alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Have a good weekend, everyone.